shared. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Tech Talk conducted by the ACRM Technology Networking Group. Uh, if you are not a member of the Technology Networking Group and would like to join, um, please visit the website uh, provided on um, the slide um, here. And I'll also add this to the chat. Um, and you can send uh, an email to one of the co-chairs as well, uh, Rachel Prophet or Lauren Sheehan. Uh, my name is um, Shatanuka Bhattacharya, and I am the co-chair of the Communications Task Force with the ACRM's Technology Networking Group. Our speakers today uh, are Dr. Rosalie Wang and Dr. Pooja Vishwanathan, and they will be speaking today on shifting the paradigm of research evidence generation in the development and evaluation of technology-based interventions. Before we get started with the presentation, I do want to advise that this meeting is being recorded, as you heard, on Zoom. Um, I'd like to ask all attendees to keep their phones or mics muted and to keep your cameras turned off during the presentation. We do expect to have about 10 to 15 minutes available for discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please free, feel free to type them in the chat and we will address them uh, as many of those uh, at, in the later part of the hour. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers, um, Dr. Rosalie Wang and Dr. Pooja Vishwanathan. Dr. Rosalie Wang is an assistant professor in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at University of Toronto. She is an affiliated member of the University of Toronto Robotics Institute and a faculty fellow of at sorry, a faculty fellow at the Schwartz Riesman Institute for Technology and Society. She's an affiliate scientist at Kite Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, the university's uh, university health network and a member of their AI and robotics in rehabilitation research team. Dr. Wang's research focuses on developing and implementing technology to enable daily activity participation and social inclusion of seniors. She's leading research in robotics for post-stroke rehabilitation and on the use of information and communication technologies by seniors with cognitive impairments. As an age well investigator, she co-led a national project on enhancing equitable access to assistive technologies. Her research applies mixed methods and user-centered design approaches. Dr. Vishwanathan has a passion for improving accessibility and independence for people with physical disabilities. She has completed doctoral and postdoctoral research in robotics, assistive technologies, and has been working with smart wheelchair technology for over a decade, publishing several peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. She's also led international workshops, collaborating with researchers and clinicians in seating and mobility around the world. She's currently founder and CEO of Brace Mobility, a company that commercialized the world's first blind spot sensors for wheelchairs. She's also driving new and important conversations in the industry around diversity and inclusion, as well as the role of academic research and clinical evidence in the development of complex rehab technology. She currently acts as a consultant for knowledge translation and commercialization of academic research and is a published author of three book chapters and peer-reviewed journal article on the topic. We look forward to your presentation and I will now uh, turn this presentation over to you.
Okay, thank you so much. Um, that took a little while to set up my slides here, but um, it's a pleasure to be here today and um, it is quite a privilege to have the space and a time together um, with the consideration that of all of the things happening in the world um, right now and um, with COVID um, still um, hanging on. Um, we're fighting it as hard as we can, but um, it is still something that is a big part of our lives at the moment. and. Um, Again, it's it's um, good to be able to have this time and space with everybody today um, to be able to talk about the research that we're doing and um, how we're going to be helping to move things forward. So um, I would like to thank um, the ACRM Technology Network Working Group for inviting us to this tech talk. Um, we are excited to be sharing our work um, on the framework for accelerated um, and systematic technology-based intervention development and evaluation evaluation research, or as we call FASTER. So Pooja and I have a long history of working together, and while our paths often diverge, we always find a way of coming back together again. Um, so today I'll be giving you some background information about FASTER and the origin story of our framework, and Pooja will discuss uh, her experiences working in academic research and development and the tech startup world, and really illustrate some concrete applications um, of aspects of FASTER and why we need to shift the paradigm in order to get technology-based interventions out to the people who can benefit from them. So our objectives today, um, we'd like to discuss the importance of evidence-based practice and why aspects of current approaches for generating high-quality research evidence are potentially inappropriate, and also to describe FASTER and its guiding principles as an alternative approach for generating evidence, and also Pooja will discuss um, example applications of faster aspects and principles within um, several projects that she's involved in. And so this project, of course, um, uh, FASTER, is a work in progress. Uh, we've only just published our paper last year, and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done uh, to advance the work. And um, it begins with engaging in broader discussions such as this about research designs and evidence generation. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled that we've had such positive feedback so far from around the world. And we've had people contacting us, including those who don't work with technology-based interventions, um, to say that this type of framework is so needed. Um, and of course, I'm very excited to hear your perspectives and your insights about evidence generation um, in the work that you do, where this topic might resonate with you or not, um, and any critical feedback that you might have um, that can help to expand our thinking and to enhance our practices. So Looking at um, who we are, I'd like to begin with um, an introduction to the FASTER Collective. And so we are an international group aimed to stimulate discussion, adoption, and promotion of the use of alternative approaches to generate evidence or um, evidence for technology-based interventions um, that are applied in disability and rehabilitation, and to advance the development and application of FASTER. Our group is comprised of academic researchers, rehabilitation clinicians, engineers, and technology developers that are driven, who are driven to um, improve and advance the integration of technology-based interventions into practice and to generate a positive impact uh, for people in society. So many of us came together um, during an international workshop on smart wheelchairs for assessment and training that was led by Pooja and me in 2014. Um, in many ways, this was the springboard for many of the discussions leading up to FASTER and the paper that we published. Um, so from our discussions at this workshop and our collective experiences working in technology-based intervention research and development and our experiences in clinical rehabilitation, we were finding that the existing paradigms with the hierarchy of evidence randomized control trials as criterion standard and clinical trials practices that were developed for drug research and development and were not really working for the kinds of rapidly evolving technologies um, that we were working with and for the populations that we were working with. And so many of the processes were not helping innovations to really reach um, those who might benefit. And so we tried to come up with another process that is more um, uh, meaningful, timely, and practical for researchers, uh, technology developers, clinicians, and those who seek um, and apply intervention evidence. So this framework is, of course, a work in progress, and we hope to build on this with several additional projects. 
So this is our paper and a snapshot of FASTER from the graphical abstract. So most of what I'll be talking about today is um, covered in the paper. Um, so FASTER essentially is a highly iterative three-phase process with four guiding principles and uh, several features that we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, we are very much influenced by complex interventions research and literature and also the design literature. So just a quick snapshot of the aims of our FASTER paper. And so we wanted to be able to um, uh, present something that could advocate for the use of alternative approaches to generating evidence in the development and evaluation of technology-based interventions. And we also wanted to propose an alternative framework and guiding principles, and most importantly, to stimulate action uh, by multiple disciplines and sectors to discuss, adopt, and promote alternative approach approaches when appropriate. So what are we talking about when we talk about technology-based interventions? So these interventions involve technology products or services and often have associated therapy practices, training, and other supports involved. And so these are considered as complex interventions. And these interventions may serve rehabilitative, assistive, or service delivery functions. And so here's just a snapshot of a few um, possible examples of the kinds of technology interventions that we're talking about. So when we think about complex interventions, technology-based interventions can readily be considered complex, um, not just because the technologies or technologies themselves are complex, but um, because the different domains that make up the intervention. And so therapy practices that are required for safe and appropriate use of the technologies, education and training for everyone involved in providing or using the intervention, and the social supports that are often needed for enabling success of the intervention. And all of these domains Combined, uh, combined constitute the intervention um, that you develop, evaluate, and ultimately implement. And added to the complexity, of course, is the, is the environments or systems in which we all operate. So first of all, why do we need FASTER? So we need a fundamental shift in how we generate evidence of technology-based interventions in disability and rehabilitation. And that was very clear to us. Um, we also need to reconsider what is defined as high quality evidence. And also um, we fundamentally would like to support the integration of these interventions into practice, particularly when technology is rapidly evolving. And so in the next several slides, um, I'll discuss why we need to shift the way we're thinking about evidence and how we generate evidence. So most of you are uh, familiar with the current approaches in disability and rehabilitation, um, but I'll just highlight a few points to provide some context um, for the rationale for creating FASTER. So current approaches in disability and rehabilitation are grounded in evidence-based practice, which stresses that clinical reasoning integrates the best available research evidence, client values, and preferences and clinical expertise. Within this framework is a hierarchy of evidence quality where the gold standard or criterion standard is um, viewed to produce the most scientifically rigorous evidence on intervention effectiveness, um, which is the randomized control trial. And the highest standard of evidence comes from systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized control trials. So when we look at clinical trials, um, they can be defined as um, any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of humans to one or more health related interventions to evaluate the effects on health outcomes. And these are viewed to um, uh, produce um, whether or produce, produce evidence on whether or not an intervention works within uh, within certain conditions and clinical trials are used in research and development of pharmaceuticals medical devices and other procedures um, but we do see most of this commonly used um, with pharmaceuticals and of course clinical trials are often defined as having four phases um, so beginning with um, testing with small groups um, to look at safety evaluation, identifying side effects, initial dose ranges, um, uh, as indicated by the WHO um, uh, set of phases. And phase two looks at testing with larger populations, looking at efficacy and safety, um, and often use randomization and controls. And phase four is testing with even larger groups with uh, often randomization, comparing new intervention with another intervention. And finally, phase four is often um, 
post-market evaluation of um, approved interventions. And this really looks at examining the effectiveness in a large population to monitor for adverse effects. So some of the issues that we have um, identified with current approaches is they can be inappropriate, unfeasible, and too slow for our technology-based interventions. And so in our paper, we summarize um, broad categories of some, um, some of these concerns. And so um, one of the concerns is some interventions may have obvious and observable observable benefits, and these can be seen with uh, types of technologies like um, assistive uh, devices. Um, some findings have limited generalizability to real world uh, contexts, and so the research um, might not be uh, readily translatable to the clients and the uh, contexts in which you work. Um, there is an over-reliance on group means and overlooking valuable individual responses or characteristics that influence the outcomes. And of course, our populations um, are um, our populations who we work with in uh, rehabilitation are often extremely heterogeneous. Um, a lot of the studies that we see um, don't take into account lo uh, lifelong use um, and the impacts of lifelong use of different types of technologies might not be considered. Um, and of course, there are cost and funding challenges associated with carrying out some of these studies. And also there is a necessity for efficiency and expediency to align with rapidly uh, developing or advancing technology, which doesn't really fit with a lot of the um, constructions of the current ways of um, uh, finding evidence. So we, when we think about the consequences of not looking at alternative approaches and what might what these might be, um, we potentially would see wasted resources and opportunities, um, which means that interventions might be poorly developed um, or evaluated and lack generalizability to our user populations. And so interventions may not be developed or translated to those who need them. Um, and so generating evidence might take too long, is too expensive, or is not providing useful data for us to apply. Um, so there could be a persistent um, and significant knowledge translation gap, and others um, have reported that implementation of evidence-based interventions from bench to bedside is about 17 years. And so that is far, far too long for the types of technologies that we're working with. Um, we also, um, by perpetuating this, um, we also maintain unattainable standards of evidence for our field. And so we see this a lot, that there's a lot of um, systematic reviews that are um, inconclusive. Um, or uh, conclude that there's more research needed. And so we potentially could have a loss of solutions and a loss of opportunity. And so there is also a persistent lack of clinical guidance for technology-based interventions. And so clinicians are not always sure what to adopt or what to um, um, uh, prescribe to their clients. And of course, then without the evidence that we need, um, there's a perpetual lag in funding policies and practices as well. So thinking about the concerns that we've talked about already, we came up with FASTER um, as an alternative approach. And so this is just an image of um, some of the key outputs for each phase that you can read about a little bit more in our paper. So what we wanted to do really is to um, uh, create FASTER in order to provide some guidance, guidance for technology developers, researchers, clinicians, and others who develop and evaluate technology-based interventions. And so it is a three-phased approach um, that's informed by established innovation design processes for example design thinking and complex interventions development and evaluation and implementation. And so we outlined guiding principles that we feel would be would need to be consciously and proactively embedded throughout the development and evaluation processes. And so we offer a selection of research methods and designs as well that might align well with creating technology-based interventions and clinical evidence for each of the different phases. So before uh, we describe um, each principle and the phases, I'd like to stress some important features of the FASTER approach. So we really emphasize iterative and rapid intervention prototyping within all of the different phases that we're looking, that we're looking at, and also to evaluate prototypes um, that may not necessarily be complete. And so we want to evaluate iteratively to ensure that we're getting feedback from users and the context in which they might use the interventions. And so we're also, we're also looking at engagement and iterative testing, particularly with users in small scale studies um, during all of the phases. And so with users, we want active inclusion of heterogeneous groups during development and evaluation so that we would be able to um, include a broader range of potential users. 
And so finally, we'd like to see early deployment and scaled replicated evaluation of interventions in real world environments. And this is really key because we can't really conclude from a very controlled study a lot of information about um, how people might use technologies um, and the interventions in the real world settings when there's a lot of different um, elements um, impacting on their use and their outcomes. So our guiding principles, um, we've laid out four of them. And so the first are three, the first um, three, which are ethical practices, user engagement and transdisciplinary and transsectoral working are all at the core of FASTER. And the fourth is process evaluation and reporting to support transparency. And so activities related to this principle occur outside of all three of the phases. And for um, example, evaluates how well our processes um, in research um, are achieving the outcomes that we want at every stage. And so transparency, of course, is really important um, to demonstrate how we arrive at our development and evaluation decisions. So now I'm going to describe um, each of the phases in a little bit more detail. And so we call these broad activities uh, phases, but really, um, as I mentioned before, they're very iterative and you may be working back and forth between different phases throughout the process to create um, your technology-based intervention. Um, at the end, we hope that we would have an intervention that is ready for use and can be integrated into clinical practice. So phase one is the development phase. Um, here we're applying design thinking as a possible approach to understand and creating a solution to a problem. Um, in this case, we chose design thinking as described by Stanford's D School, which outlines the design modes of empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Um, we also align these modes um, with critical elements in complex intervention development described by Blydenberg and uh, colleagues in 2018. And so these are shown by the yellow arrows. So engaging in these activities is felt to enhance our understanding of intervention users and their contexts and uh, to better define the concerns at hand and make the best use of existing knowledge and theories to design and test an intervention prototype with the greatest uh, chances for success. So we list here some potential research methods and designs that are suitable for um, this phase, um, the development phase, and possible outputs that we see um, are systematically and comprehensively developed and documented intervention um, and delivery processes and preliminary user feedback um, in order to refine the intervention and delivery processes. So this slide is just a reminder of how important it is to incorporate existing evidence and theory in designing uh, technology-based interventions. So in these scenarios, we need to bridge engineering and clinical sciences in uh, creating an intervention. So it's not just looking at something that is technically able to address a problem, but also looking at what clinical practices um, and knowledge and treatment theories need to be used to or need to be included that underpin the intervention. And so something that is noted to be missing in a lot of the literature on intervention is how they're developed and what explanatory models there are uh, behind the intervention. So in phase two, um, we're looking at progressive usability and uh, feasibility evaluation. And so for this, we're looking at intervention prototypes that are evaluated in a small scale, in small scale studies with users, um, ideally again in real world settings. And we envision multiple study approaches and designs that are used in one study or a series of studies looking at usability and feasibility related outcomes. And so um, we've listed a wider range of um, possible research methods and designs here. And the outputs that we foresee in this phase are a comprehensively um, designed, um, uh, a comprehensive understanding um, of users' interventions and delivery processes and the context and evidence for usability and feasibility. And again, feedback to um, inform our intervention processes. The final stage um, here, again, it's all iterative, involves scaled and evaluation, scaled evaluation and implementation. So we envision progressively scaled up studies at this phase and um, a deployment with users in real world contexts. And so in this phase, we have replications of um, uh, studies with varying user groups varying clinical clinic, clinician characteristics, care contexts, and geographic locations in order to create a robust body of evidence. And again, um, more uh, research methods and designs can be added here. 
So the outputs that we foresee um, at this stage um, are evidence for short and long-term effectiveness, um, abandonment um, concerns and impacts on, uh, of use on functional and participation in social and economic outcomes. Uh, we also expect cumulative, cumulative evidence from multiple studies um, on the impacts of the intervention to support broad implementation, in addition to further evidence to refine the intervention and delivery. So, um, finally, I just wanted to note here that um, with regards to research methods and designs, um, we emphasize diverse methods and designs, and of course, no single research method or design is universally uh, suitable and effective, and so the study, um, uh, the selection of the design must match the study goals and the research questions, and of course, the maturity of the intervention, and of course, all methods and designs have their strengths and weaknesses, which need to be balanced in your selection process. Um, of course, there are still outstanding challenges um, for our development of this framework and its implementation. And so uh, we do need to look at um, ongoing innovations in research designs and statistical approaches. And these need to be integrated into evidence review grading systems that we should discuss in the future. And um, again, reconsideration of evidence hierarchies and levels of evidence quality for non uh, randomized control trial designs. And we're also needing to look at evidence requirements and benchmarks benchmarks for practice integration or commercialization. Um, at the moment, it's unclear and policy, policy decisions are um, not made um, on research evidence alone. Um, we are in the process of looking at designing or creating some guidance tools for the application of FASTER and um, some proposed benefits and drawbacks of the application need also to be explored in future work. So just a few references. And so thank you. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Pooja. And here are a few ways to um, contact us if you would like to um, provide feedback or uh, start a discussion, get involved, um, however you'd like to um, uh, engage with us. So thank you. I just need you to stop sharing, Leslie. It says I can't share while you're yes. sharing. Okay. So uh, as Rosalie mentioned, she's already given you a lot of food for thought, hopefully with the framework. And so I'm going to try and make it a little more concrete with an actual application where you'll notice a lot of elements of FASTER. One thing I also want to actually um, note is that FASTER, the FASTER framework was, was actually created after a, a lot of this journey that I'm gonna be sharing. And so in some ways, we've actually used a lot of our experiences, uh, my experiences through uh, starting my company, Braze Mobility, and a lot of the other experiences that a lot of us in, our, in the FASTER collective uh, have had and, and actually brought those lessons into cre the creation of the FASTER framework. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. And then before I start, I also want to disclose uh, conflicts of interest here. So uh, in full transparency, I am the CEO and founder of Braze Mobility. Uh, and have patents submitted on on um, uh, on that application as well. So uh, we'll put that out there. Okay. So so jumping right into uh, and and doing a quick sort of preview, uh, some of the important features of Faster, which are described in the in the paper as well, are iterative and rapid intervention prototyping, engagement and iterative testing with users and other stakeholders in small scale small scale studies during all phases. Early deployment and scaled and replicated evaluation of interventions in real world environments. And then finally, active inclusion of heterogeneous groups of users during development and evaluation. And so I'm going to now be going through the case study and we will circle back uh, and look at all of these features that um, have been checked off uh, in, in the development of the blind spot sensors. So I will now be sharing um, the, the, the journey of developing the world's first blind spot sensors for wheelchairs. And I just wanted to acknowledge a lot of funders and supporters here, some of which I have listed on this slide. We have a lot more, um, but you know the the, the sorts of um, eight organizations that I've listed here actually do span across um, research and academia to the entrepreneurship ecosystem to clinical partners. So just want to acknowledge the the whole village uh, that it takes to raise a startup. 
I'm very grateful for that support. So starting with um, what I'm going to be sharing today is a result of over a decade of research in smart wheelchairs by myself and, and as well as a lot of other colleagues. And the key takeaway really that I, I hope you'll get from this talk is that faster and, and in this application, as you will see, um, the process is really not linear. Um, you will see that we went back and forth quite a bit in terms of needs identification, uh, the problem itself, uh, solution, the testing, and so on. And so one thing to keep in mind is that FASTER is, is not actually in, in anywhere in the framework is it defined to be a sequential process. Uh, it is really meant to actually be quite iterative, and you might be doing a lot of going forward and backwards as you go through that process. So just something to keep in mind. So <clears throat> when I started off, uh, I unfortunately did, did see this as a very linear process, as I think a lot of uh, uh, developers often do. So this is the start of my work, and this was in 2006 in my PhD thesis. Uh, the project was called NOAA, which was Navigation and Obstacle Avoidance Help. And when I started, I really started with this, what, what we refer to in the development world as the waterfall model. So it really goes one way. Uh, you start with a problem. In our case, it was older adults with dementia in long-term care who were being denied power wheelchair use because of safety concerns. The next step from there was to go off and build a solution. In our case, uh, we felt that the best solution was a smart wheelchair that would automatically stop uh, before any imminent collisions. And because some of the uh, target population was individuals with cognitive impairment, we also felt like providing wayfinding assistance would be a good feature of that solution. Then the next step was to test the solution. Um, and I'll, I'll go through these steps in a little bit more detail, but the, the solution or the, the test involved single subject design with six users with mild to moderate cognitive impairment. And the testing was done in a fairly controlled environment. And then the last stage, of course, was to publish. And in my case, this was a peer reviewed article in a computer science conference. And here is the citation for the publication. So I'll show you a quick video of what the bit of the, the system look like. What you're going to see here is uh, an individual that's driving in a powered wheelchair. There is a, a stereo vision camera facing forwards that is looking for obstacles in the way. Um, you will notice that when the participant gets close to an obstacle, the chair will slow down and stop. And so you'll hear a clicking noise, uh, which shows that the participant can't really drive forward anymore. And then they will also receive some prompts telling them that they're actually off route and they need to turn right. So let's play that video right here. There, the user being, is being prevented from oh, moving into the right. obstacle, and you just heard an off route prompt as well. So now they're going to go through the process of backing up and, and turning around so they don't hit anything. Off route, turn right. Turn right. And then eventually, once they get on the right route, you'll hear a prompt that tells them to move forward. And so that's how the system uh, worked. And just some lessons learned here. So um, what we learned from this whole thing, and if you saw in the video there, uh, the, the environment was quite controlled. As I mentioned earlier, it was a maze that the users had to navigate from one end to the other. And when I started the study, it really was a very typical sort of computer science thesis with a lot of quantitative data. So we were looking at collisions prevented, you know, how quickly users were getting to their goals. And all of these results were very promising. But what I recognized was that numbers don't tell the whole story. Um, the other main lesson learned here was that it took me four hours of developing the system between 2006 and 2010 before my first user engagement. And a lot of this is really around the challenges with um, 
uh, obtaining REB or research ethics board approvals. And so this is quite common where we'll often see uh, a long time for the ethics to get approved. In the meanwhile, you've got your research teams that are developing the technology. And then finally, when they end up talking to the user, you know, a lot of time has passed in, in terms of developing that solution before really getting any uh, concrete feedback. And so in my case, you know, at the end of the study, I had a lot of really great feedback, but no more time left to incorporate that feedback back into the PhD project. The system had been developed, the study was done, I need to publish, I need to graduate. Uh, and so um, really my, my concern out of all of this was, well, what's, what's gonna happen next? Um, you know, we've got this great feedback. Um, you know, it, it, there was the, this, the concern that now this project could potentially be shelved or perhaps even picked up by a master's uh, student, um, but there was no saying what direction it was gonna go in. And so I decided that I wasn't quite done with this research and decided to really um, address some of those gaps uh, that I had found during my PhD work ended up coming back to Toronto to do a postdoctor, uh, postdoctorate uh, project. And this time, what I did was address those, those um, gaps systematically. So first of all, I used rapid prototyping and iterative development. And I did this through the use of what uh, is typically called a Wizard of Oz study. For those of you who aren't familiar with Wizard of Oz, I like to describe it as fake it till you make it. And so what this means in the context of our research was we had a hidden researcher that was standing sort of behind the, the participant as the participant was driving a power chair. And they were using a remote control to drive the, the wheelchair as though it was a smart wheelchair and was doing all of these, you know, kind of automatic speed corrections and so on automatically. And so as far as the participant was concerned, they were getting that experience of a smart wheelchair without us actually needing to build out that technology. And so as a result of that, we were actually able to get very good feedback. Um, the other advantage of doing this is now we were no longer constrained to just testing out one kind of smart wheelchair system. We said, why not test out three different types of interventions because we're mocking them all up anyway. Um, and so here, what we have then is still a fairly sequential process, or the, although there was some iteration, uh, the problem still being older adults in, with dementia and long-term care being denied power wheelchair use. But the solution in this case was three different types of collision avoidance interventions. The first was very similar to NOAA, uh, an automatic speed correction and stop. The second was automatic steering correction. So instead of slowing down or stopping the user, it would actually steer them away from the obstacle. And then lastly, a fully autonomous system that would just take them from point A to point B with minimal or no user input. This, this system was tested once again, single subject design with 10 users with mild to moderate, if cogn uh, moderate cognitive impairment. And we still did test in a somewhat controlled environment in that there was not a lot of traffic. Um, the study area was cleared for the participants, but it was in more natural settings. And so what we actually used was settings taken right out of the power mobility indoor driving assessment, which is frequently uh, done to assess uh, uh, users for eligibility for power wheelchair use. And so things like driving down a hallway, down, you know, and, and turning at the end of the hallway, uh, going in and out of elevators, um, back in parking, things like that. And then this time we publish in more transdisciplinary uh, venues. So we uh, publish in computer science and rehab venues. Here's some of the publications. So in the, the first one you see there uh, is a, a journal on um, autonomous robots. And then the second was an American control conference. And then la the last one was on, uh, was in a disability and rehab journal. So, um, the really interesting thing here uh, was, you know, we found, we found some great, really great results, but what we really accomplished in, in taking this more sort of rapid prototyping approach was in some ways we've created now a platform that we could use for testing many, many other smart wheelchair interventions. And so many other projects now spun out of this work. And so the reason now you're seeing these new arrows is not only were we iterating in terms of building and testing the solution, some of those solutions were now in informing new problems and identifying new needs that we could then go on and again, once again build more solutions for. So some examples of some of these, the first example there was an automated back and parking system because we recognized that back and parking was challenging. The second uh, was the development evaluation of just a user interface, so just the interface part alone. Uh, the third was a system uh, that would help with users trying to park or dock underneath 
tables, which also we found was quite anxiety inducing for a lot of the users in, our, in that Wizard of Oz study. And then finally, we took the idea of this remote control operation, but instead of it being used in this sort of Wizard of Oz uh, methodology, we explored the use of the remote control as a tool that clinicians could use while they were training uh, new users for powered mobility. So these were all different projects that spun out of that work. Now, after all of this, I found that I was still uh, really, you know, questioning where we would go with this. Um, what we discovered, and through all of these different studies, we got a lot of mixed reactions. We found some very interesting insights, uh, realized a lot of the limitations around this technology, what sorts of things need to be addressed, but we were really no closer to commercializing the system. And so Rosalie and I uh, put together this workshop called SWAT, Smart Wheelchairs and Assessment and Training, and we brought together people from all over the world who had experience in developing smart wheelchairs or who were involved in, in wheelchair assessment and training to really answer this question of why is this technology not been commercialized? And so we sat and brainstormed for a day and a half and we, we got really unexpected um, results from this workshop. And one of them was that there were a lot of tensions between the different groups. So please feel free to read this publication. I have the link here. Um, even if you're not in the smart wheelchair arena, I, I think a lot of the challenges that we found there do translate into a lot of other projects that we see, especially in uh, interdisciplinary sort of project teams. You'll notice a lot of the tensions there might be quite familiar uh, to you. And so personally then reflecting on what this workshop, um, kind of what sort of insights that it created for me, um, I realized that there were a lot of gaps in understanding clinical needs as a developer myself. And I saw that was the case for a lot of the other engineers as well, where the engineers would often get excited about things and realize that there was, you know, the clinicians were really not as excited because they didn't see the value uh, for their clients. Uh, we did see that there was a huge lack of engagement from end users. We didn't have any end users at this workshop, which turned out to be a, a major gap uh, that we needed to fix their families, informal and formal caregivers. And finally, I also felt like we hadn't really included, although we did have an industry partner that participated in some part of the conference, they weren't really engaged as a partner throughout the process, especially not during our, our actual R&D phases. So really felt like that needed, a, we need to do a bit more work there. And finally, what the industry partner actually really highlighted for us was the lack of market validation. So even though we had all of this feedback, we hadn't necessarily asked all of the questions that we needed to ask to figure out what the, um, what the, the real market need for this technology was. And so this really prompted me uh, to uh, kind of pivot out of the academic environment and really look at answering some of these questions in the context of a startup. And so I went on to form what became Braze Mobility. And one of the first things I did before I did anything else uh, was fix the stakeholder engagement problem. And so went out and engaged with a lot of individuals at local accessibility events, engaged with community partners like March of Dimes in some of the um, events that they held and went and did focus groups there, uh, did breakfast and learns or lunch and learns with local seating clinics, sometimes even organized our own events because we re realized that a lot of our end users were missing at the uh, community accessibility events because oftentimes these events were not wheelchair accessible. And so we had to create our own events that were actually wheelchair accessible so we could get our intended users there. Uh, and then we just spoke to just about everybody. Um, we got referrals through clinicians, users, distributors, researchers, really anyone that we could talk to to get that multi-stakeholder perspective. So here's a um, quick video of kind of where we started uh, at the beginning of the company, very similar to the NOAA technology. And here you'll see, um, this was a very uh, rough prototype, as you will see. Uh, it is actually a hula hoop that's been glued around this, uh, this chair and it's using infrared sensors here, but you see the chair stops automatically um, when the user gets too close to the wall and then um, displays feedback through the forms of light. So this was the first time we experimented with the idea uh, of offering a visual uh, feedback on obstacles in the environment through this LED light ring that was placed around the joystick. And this would um, do it you know, forwards and backwards, there would be sensors that would be detecting obstacles. Skip that. So some of the insights that we got from doing this, and, and 
you know, note now that we were not no longer just in the long term care context, we broadened uh, out the user group and, and gone out into the community and, and we're talking to wheelchair users across the board with various diagnoses and various levels of cognition. And what we noticed was that people that we talked to did not want the chair to take control. They felt like the ability to adapt and customize the system was very important. Um, they felt like affordability and payment flexibility was critical. Customer support is really essential, something we don't really think about too much in the academic context. And we recognize that in order to be able to have these sorts of products reimbursed, we would need to partner with durable medical equipment providers. And finally, which is probably the biggest insight for me, is I recognize that going to the user's natural environment was so important. Their home uh, sessions with their clinicians. And, and the reason for that is in, in over a decade of research that I had done, I had never actually visited a client's home. We always had um, you know, the, the participants of the study come to the lab. And what I did not get from that was how much property damage was happening in the homes of our intended users. And that was actually what went on to give us some of the insights that we ended up having. So, um, you know, because we don't cover too much of this in the paper, I kind of wanted to go over, we, we very briefly mentioned the idea of a business model canvas. And so I, I'm going to give you a, kind of a quick example of some of the things that we were thinking about when we were creating this business model canvas. And I've really simplified this. And I, I, like, I really like to start with this very simple model where you have three points here, the target market, the solution, and the problem. And the idea here is you can start at any one of these points, but you want to keep kind of circling back uh, to all three in order to really find uh, a solution that's going to solve the problem and that's going to um, have a, a good product market fit as well, which means it's, it's actually solving uh, the need of, of the market and has a, a sizable market. So some of the issues that we came across in terms of taking this technology to market that I just showed you was what the FDA classification would be. Since it was a system that would intervene with the chair controls, we anticipated that it would be a class two, which was at, you know, at least as high of a classification as the power wheelchair itself. We were unclear on then what the safety standards needed to be. How are we going to determine those safety standards? What if you had clients that um, didn't have the ability to override the, the, the system or to identify errors in the system? Uh, the other issue here was this, since we were still right now targeting long-term care residents, as you see here, long-term care residents with cognitive impairment or motor control issues, who need power wheelchairs were, was our target initially. Uh, that's a very difficult, uh, long-term care is a difficult target market to access. We were unclear about provision rules for wheelchairs and how this sort of system would impact that. Um, the clients that we were developing with the system for, would they even be allowed to use power wheelchairs regardless of whether this sort of system was implemented? Uh, the market size was fairly small. The cost of the system would be pretty high. And so we're not quite sure about affordability or fundability. Uh, we felt like the intervention could actually be somewhat excessive, especially if you had clients who were cognitively intact. And since we did see fairly low preference across the board for the speed correction feature in that Wizard of Oz study, um, again, and, and we saw that appear again, even when we were testing with users without cognitive impairment, we really weren't quite sure if that was going to be a, a good um, system to, to take to market. And so we ended up from there pivoting to a, a very different type of system. And so what we did was we set aside the intervention part of the system in terms of um, modifying the wheelchair controls and instead decided to explore a system that only gave alerts. And so what we ended up doing was offering alerts. You know, let me just play a quick video here. So the system could be installed on any power or manual wheelchair and essentially would detect obstacles and offer alerts to the user through lights. And you see the different colors, sounds, and vibrations. So what did this help us do? Um, well, it helped us actually um, you know, eliminate a lot of the issues that we were seeing in going to market with the previous system. Uh, so issues around FDA classification and so on, this, this sort of system would not even be considered a medical device because it doesn't actually intervene with the wheelchair at all. Um, we have now broadened the market. And so now we've pivoted from the target market that I defined earlier to any mobility device user who wants or needs more spatial awareness. So the problem now is, is no longer 
uh, the inability to drive safely, but it is, is really just blind spots and that, that lack of spatial awareness. Uh, and so if you look at our value proposition that we then define is for mobility device users who want more independence and awareness of obstacles while backing up, we've developed a low cost aftermarket product that provides multimodal and customizable feedback to the user. It can be adapted to various mobility devices, including manual and power wheelchair users. And this is a very typical exercise that you go through when you're building your, uh, uh, your business model canvas is that value proposition. So you see here, we've taken a lot of those lessons learned around cost and affordability and, and multimodality and customizability and adaptability. Um, and so that's, that's the, the, the value proposition that we landed on. And here I talk about backing up. Of course, since then, we also expanded to sensors all around the chair so we could help with uh, individuals who needed support while navigating forwards as well. So I'll just play uh, this video that, that really kind of, um, you can hear from the customers what the impact of this sort of technology is. I've been in a wheelchair just over two years. I've been in a wheelchair for 25 years now. I injured myself in an ATV accident. Two years ago on Christmas Eve, literally they dropped this wheelchair off to me. Within hours of me getting in this place, I had pretty much destroyed my apartment. Not a lot of damage in my house, not my furniture, and not a lot of things over unintentional. And after a while, you just start ignoring it because you're either constantly frustrated with the damage you do. So now it's kind of like two or three dents in the wall a day is just normal. To have a device back there that is literally watching my back is an amazing feeling. When we added this sensor unit to the chair, it was just amazing to. It gives you an alert before you hit something because you don't do it intentionally. Like I said, it just it lets you know where, where you are. When you're back into a door frame. I can tell if I'm centered in the doorway because the sensor is detecting both door posts as I go through. So I can actually back out of there just by looking at the lights and no longer rip that. The door handle's actually been on there ever since this device has been on my wheelchair. It's never been taken off once. So that's a, that's a record for me. If this was taken off of my wheelchair now, I would feel totally exposed. I think that anyone who's using a power chair uh, would benefit from the situation. And there's even situations where it might be beneficial to someone in the annual chair or even someone who's just uh, has issues looking behind them. Being in a wheelchair is the only time I ever felt you know, like I could become a victim. When I travel to Toronto, Montreal, it doesn't matter where I go, everything is in the backpack that is hanging off the back of this chair. Most of the time, once I've opened the zipper on the backpack, I can't close it or I can't close it all the way. It would be easier to prey on than somebody who can't even feel or know that they're back there. And that's, for me, that's one of the things I like most about having these sensors on the back of the chair. And I think this would be a huge compliment. It is for me, and I believe that it would be for a lot of people who just do not go out because you know they're a security issue and that dignity issue where any device that gives you a piece of your dignity back makes you feel a little bit more secure in your surroundings well that says it all to me right there and so here you just see i just like to throw the slide in is the evolution you see that hula hoop design coming all the way to the sensors at the bottom which is where we're at right now so, um, you know, I do want to say that um, it, although I did sort of leave, you know, academic environment, although I don't know if I've quite left because I keep uh, doing presentations with Rosalie and still very much involved uh, on, on new and exciting things, um, is, you know, now I look at research very differently, right? So I look at um, what new research questions that we can ask. And so ever since we've developed the system, we've actually gone back and, and asked new research questions. This is a, an example here. Um, of a, a recent study that has been published. It's a single subject design and uses case studies as well to explore rear visibility and the impact on driving. Um, and, you know, I have to say, uh, and, and we have a few other things in the works as well, but I, I, despite all the collaborations that I have been involved with, I have to say, I still haven't completely figured out how academia and industry can really work together effectively and efficiently, uh, even in some of the most recent studies what I have found is that the need for support and service provision during real world trials is very challenging because we don't currently know exactly how to fund that type of work. Um, we don't know how to really process that 
and document those those sorts of processes in a transparent way to be able to understand what sort of impact uh, that customer support and service provision piece has uh, on the user's experience. And you know, we really do need have a need for customization in complex rehab. And again, this goes back to why randomized control trials are perhaps not the best approach because um, every customer that we have, for example, at, at Braids is different and their setup is different. And so single subject designs, uh, case studies are all actually very effective and, and very useful in these cases because you can in fact customize the system for each client and use um, each client's um, uh, performance as their own, their own baseline, right? So because you have each subject as their own baseline, you can in fact have very different setups for each, for each uh, um, test per, uh, a user or participant. And so going back then to where I started, you can see that we've checked off all of these boxes and a lot of other things are still, still very much in progress. Definitely larger scale testing is still in the works. And I, so I wanna end on this one slide. Uh, because I think this this is really my personal reflection of what I used to do as a researcher and what I do today as an entrepreneur. And this is by no means a general comment on um, how researchers generally uh, function. This is really a reflection of of how I was as a researcher. And I'm sure there's there you know I would go back and do things quite differently. But as a researcher, I didn't really talk to my users until I had REB or Research Ethics Board approval, and that was often too late in the project. As an entrepreneur, I talk to my clients every week. Um, as advisors and mentors, I focus more on pain points rather than solutions or features. We call those problem interviews rather than solution interviews. Uh, as a researcher, I maintained, uh, I, was, I was very objective and maintained professional distance from my users. Today, I build personal relationships with all of my clients. They're on speed dial. As an academic, I often spend months and even years publishing in peer reviewed journals. I don't know who is currently reading these. And so although we still do publish and I still do publish, I think I'm a lot more thoughtful about what to disseminate and how to disseminate. And so there is actually a strategy behind it. And then finally, and this is something we're thinking about as researchers, when we conduct studies, we often own the technology. We're running the study, we're controlling the grant. And as an entrepreneur, I actually flipped that model around. We created a beta client program where our clients own the technology. In fact, they paid safety deposits to get a hold of the technology, which meant that they had skin in the game, which also meant that they were incentivized to give us feedback early and often. So that's it for the case study. And I will end here. Uh, we, both Rosalie and I are very keen to hear from you on what we talked about today resonates with you. Uh, what do you think you might be able to use? What do you think is missing? Uh, what other opportunities do you see uh, to be able to apply this framework and what some of the barriers might be? So um, we will end right there and uh, take any questions if you have some. I see one raised hand. If you if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can enter your question in the chat. However, you how however you see fit. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, amazing presentation. Um, I read the article a few months ago, and I was really excited um, uh, of having this uh, faster approach and. Um, well, seeing this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an alternative to, to be able to, to put in practice something that is not going to be uh, just lost on the way as uh, usually happens with different technologies. So um, I, I know that this is new. Uh, I would like just to ask about uh, once this paper is out, uh, what ha which have been the reactions of uh, of people in the industry and clinicians and uh, what have you heard about this? I find this really exciting, but uh, I would like just to know what other people, uh, the feedback you have received about this. Yeah, maybe I can start and then Pooja, if you have anything to add. Um, so far, the feedback that we've gotten um, from um, 
researchers and um, others around the world have been really, really positive in actually a very surprising sort of way, um, because um, it's it's great to you know have people read your papers, but then for them to email you and um, you know ask you to describe more and um, talk to our group about it and you know invite us to be uh, consulting on some of their projects um, in terms of um, structuring their study designs and development it's it's absolutely um, exciting and really positive for us um, and I, I think the other thing that I would like to add is um, the thing that surprised us a little bit is um, people were finding applications um, outside of um, technology-based intervention development. And so um, I've talked to um, a researcher in um, the UK who's looking at, um, her, her work is um, looking at educational technology, but her sort of application was thinking about um, um, educational practices. And so um, another group um, actually in Toronto uh, looking at it, international development has also contacted us because they're um, looking to see what other approaches there might be for um, application because they also find that it's very difficult to work within the existing paradigm for the diverse environments that they do their um, community-based rehabilitation um, within. So it's been really exciting. We've gotten some um, really encouraging feedback um, there are um, actually from the peer reviews from our paper, um, they, they were very positive as well, um, but they also did highlight a few things that we definitely need to explore, um, looking at how we sort of integrate with um, some of the content that uh, Pooja had presented, how we integrate with um, um, industry and um, looking at um, FDA approvals and things like that, definitely areas that we need to explore further to see how that um, plays out. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's been really positive, but we're definitely looking for more people to talk to, more people to engage with and sort of expand some of the ideas. And we definitely have blind spots in different areas. And so we really, really um, would appreciate if anybody could just contact us and give us some thoughts. Um, yeah, uh, Pooja, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was going to say, I think just the fact that the demand for us to speak about this paper, I mean, I don't remember the last time we did so many presentations in such a short period of time on the paper, you know, like including the, this tech talk. So uh, I think we've, we've gotten a lot more requests to speak on this topic from groups that we typically have, haven't done a lot of knowledge dissemination in the past. So that's been really exciting because that's, I think, part of this, this whole thing is, is actually about more stakeholder engagement and going beyond the usual venues uh, and the, the usual suspects that you know researchers pre presenting to other researchers. So I think that's been really exciting. I, in fact, just this, mor just this morning or yesterday got um, a request to do a, a CEU around this topic uh, for, for a um, durable medical equipment provider. So you know, I, they're, they're showing interest in this sort of thing. I think they're understanding the importance of evidence and also realizing that with the current approaches, we're, we're actually not bringing evidence into um, into industry and, and there is a huge gap. And so that can't be, it can't be an excuse anymore that complex, you know, rehab is, is such a, a new industry and, you know, we don't, we haven't been around long enough to get evidence. Like those sorts of excuses aren't really going to cut it anymore. Um, we need to be able to use some of the, the, the methods that we talked about today to be able to bring that evidence and to inform uh, the technologies in, in complex rehab as well. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's been phenomenal. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, uh, excellent framework. I, uh, the, 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 as you mentioned, there, there has to be like, uh, um, well, further work probably trying to um, convince um, funding agencies <laughs> that this is the way to go. Uh, and uh, I, I'm starting to to include your approach in uh, in my um, in my applications. <laughs> so thanks for that. <laughs> Actually, that was also one of the motivators um, for us to look at this as well, because we have an approach, um, if it's not published, it doesn't have a lot of um, credibility. And so we we're really happy that we were able to put it together and that, um, yeah, some of the motivation for um, many of our co-authors um, was really, we need to like pin down what we're trying to do and the background rationale for it. And the only real way to do that is to be able to have a pub paper published about it. So it's just the beginning. <laughs> but thank you for that, Alexander. 
Thank you so much, um, Rosalie and Pooja, uh, for the really interesting and informative presentation. I, I do appreciate you sharing your expertise, and I do agree we need to have these conversations more often, not just limited to the tech talks, but this is a great starting ground. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting, I think you had shared, uh, yes, uh, your email addresses. That's uh, I was going to just say. And uh, awesome. So I, I believe we are we have gone uh, over our time by just a tad bit. So I'm going to end this year and would encourage everyone attending to please reach out uh, to both uh, Dr. Rosalie Wang and Dr. Pooja Vishwanathan for their, uh, for any questions you might have, for any uh, any discussions for on this conversation further. I also thank everyone for attending today's Tech Talk. Uh, the recording for this presentation will be available in the next 48 hours on our uh, ACRM Technology Networking Group website. Please recommend this Tech Talk series to your colleagues. We will have our next Tech Talk in August of 2022. Um, so please stay tuned for more information about it. And um, I'm, I'm sad to end this conversation early. I would love to have this conversation continue for another hour, but I'm hoping I'll be able to do that by reaching out uh, to uh, both Dr. Wang and Dr. Vishwanathan, and also maybe during our uh, annual conference in November as well. So uh, great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Again, this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Shatanika, and thank you everyone for attending. Looking forward to catching up more. So. Thank you.